from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. Coming up on Ag Day, the latest update on planting progress. Have farmers busted out of the weather lockup? And with a slow start to planting, Bob Butterback talks weather markets in today's analysis. Let's say the bulls are absolutely right. <laughs> right. We have delayed planting. We don't get the crop planted mid-May. China problems resolve. It turns off, goes from cold and wet to 2012 meant hot and dry. Across the ocean, it's also a slow start for farmers in Europe. Global glut of milk is weighing heavily on prices, and a forage expert practices what he preaches on his own land. Ag Day, brought to you by the Chevy Silverado, the most dependable, longest lasting full size pickups on the road. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. American farmers feel like this week is the unofficial start to planting season as temperatures look to be on the rise in the heartland. The latest crop progress report still showing a slow start to planting season. Soybeans popping up for the first time this week. Nationally, 2% is in the ground, most of that in the south. That's right on pace with the five-year average. Winter wheat conditions, they're holding steady this week at 31% good to excellent. While spring wheat planting is rolling along, 3% is planted, but it's way behind the five-year average of 25%. And corn planting has now reached 5%. 10 points behind the average pace. Nebraska, Illinois, and Indiana are all started. However, Iowa planting remains at zero this week. It's normally in double digits by now. So how long does it take to get a corn crop in? The University of Illinois has been doing some figuring. They looked at data from the 1980s through 2017, sticking with Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana. The results show the corn crop can be put in given 14 days suitable for field work. That's down about a day from the early 1980s. April will be one of the three coldest on record for the Corn Belt. There have been seven similar years since 1960 or the modern corn growing era. Corn yields fell short in six of the seven. Well, the detrended yield for 2018 is right around 171 bushels per acre. Most of those years had yields between 166 and 170. Uh, one of the worst years was 1983. Uh, that was an outlier though. We don't think that's one to focus on, but that one was much lower in the 140s. The researchers say assuming the three I states are representative of the entire Corn Belt, 14 days is also the estimate of field days needed to plant the entire U.S. corn crop. Temperatures are warming up in northern Indiana, which means field work is finally beginning. The area just received snow a week ago. Now temperatures are inching higher and farmers are turning wheels rushing to get the crop in. South Bend, Indiana farmer Jeff Peterson says he did some field work over the weekend and the beginning of this week. However, it will be a while before he dusts off the planter. I would say we have a good week and a half of uh, field work um, and also the fertilizer spreading to finish that up. Northern Indiana is the next stop on the I-80 planning tour. Join us for that story tomorrow on Ag Day. The U.S. isn't the only country with a winter that won't leave. In the U.K., weather is wreaking havoc with farmers' crops, livestock, and finances after freezing winter temperatures persisted into spring. But like here, the mercury is set to rise in coming weeks. The deep freeze that held this Worcestershire farm in its grip has melted. But farmer Adam Lockwood is now playing catch up with his crop. He grows vegetables, and this field of onions are behind in maturity. We're looking at having about 15, 16 million onions in this field. And they're all behind. Lockwood's been unable to sow new seeds because the fields have been so waterlogged. But he considers himself one of the fortunate farmers in the region. Everything is drilled by seed. So, for example, we were due to start in the middle of February. We didn't start drilling until the middle of March, you know, a month behind. Um, with growers that are growing things like lettuces or brassica plants, and, you know, they've got seed being propagated in nurseries and they're transplanting in the field. They're looking at throwing weeks worth of plants away, which is massive costs and massive impacts on businesses. Across the UK, the prolonged wet and cold weather has left farmers and livestock owners with failing crops, dead animals, and rising production costs. During the cold, some dairy farmers were forced to dump their milk because the tanks needed to transport it couldn't get to them. Snow blew in under the roof tiles at this lambing barn. Ewes and lambs died as a result. Livestock farmers are now facing rising electricity, fuel, and feed prices. According to forecaster Simon Keeling, who supplies weather data to farms all over the UK, it's probably the most snow cover over a whole season that Britain has seen since 1989. 
we've actually seen global temperatures fall over the last couple of months. Now, that's not to deny that the long-term trend is upwards. It is. Farmers are now hoping the weather this summer will be kinder to their crops and their animals as they work to overcome a long and difficult winter. Farmers in the UK say prices for their products are also up. They're worried consumers will shop with their wallets, buying products that are less expensive. Temperatures are warming up across the Corn Belt. Mike Hoffman has the latest in crop comments. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Clinton. Dennis Bogards is finally in the fields in Pella, Iowa. Dennis says it's a beautiful day to be outside in southeastern parts of the state. He says a lot of equipment is running this week as well. Temperatures are starting to climb in Plattsville, Wisconsin. Becca Hilby says one of her calves, Barney, is finally catching some rays. The snow has melted in her area and farmers are now in the field. She says it's about time spring decided to show up. I think a lot of people agree with that one. Wind speed forecast a little bit in the mid-Atlantic. Northern Plains states as we head through the afternoon. Kind of those same areas, although the uh, Plains winds will begin to develop farther south into Kansas. And you can see as we head through uh, tomorrow morning from the southern Great Lakes into uh, New Mexico, some fairly windy conditions. That area will shift a little bit off to the southeast and a new area it forms in North Dakota. We'll have details on your forecast coming up, but first here are some hometown temps. Keeping track of the shifting market prices has never been so easy. Get the latest commodity prices sent directly to your cell phone with market updates. Just text MARKETS8 to 31313 to get started. If there's a weather scare this summer, are you ready to take advantage or protect your livestock operation? Bob Utterback joins us next to discuss being prepared. Plus, meet an Arkansas farmer who's also an extension specialist who puts his forage expertise to the test in his own operation. Yeah. Um, With a uniquely powerful formulation of proven ingredients, Resicor <laughs> Corn Herbicide gives you extraordinary power. Who wants dessert? At least when it comes to weeds. In agribusiness, a very mixed start to the week. Let's head over to Chicago and see you for an update. Soybeans? really fell. Uh, the U.S. dollar index was uh, sharply higher and uh, that really put some serious pressure on the market. And we've been down for almost like six sessions in a row, which is uh, kind of not like soybeans at this time of the year. Uh, but there is the, some traders are just like unraveling their positions and everyone's waiting for the, you know, the, the, the quick markets to try to get involved. The corn has rebounded because Friday's sell off was just a little bit overdone and it, it rebounded pretty well. And in spite of the fact that the U.S. dollar index is higher, uh, corn is actually pretty strong and technically the, tr uh, the, the trend uh, should have actually turned lower and we see the market uh, starting to make uh, almost uh, some new highs. Today cattle was higher, uh, sharply higher actually. The beef prices are really starting to strengthen that futures market. Finally we got some good news. Uh, the cattle on feed report on Friday as well as some of the supplies uh, told us that um, the cutouts are very, very strong and it's possibly looking that uh, we're going to have a prolonged upturn in the market. That's all from the floor at the CME Group. Here in Chicago, I'm Virginia McGaffey. Here at the Agribusiness Desk, we have Bob Utterback, Utterback Marketing. Uh, Bob, let's talk about uh, the middle of the summer. I know it's still early spring. We're still trying to get the crop in the ground, but you know, we always sit back and say, well, what if? What if we have some sort of weather scare? There's some sort of rally Part of that is strategy of how you actually do something right. about it. Right? And I think you got to start getting your head now. Visualize what are you going to do if December corn, if the bulls are right. Let's say the bulls are absolutely right. <laughs> right. We have delayed planting. We don't get the crop planted mid-May. China problems resolved. It turns off, goes from cold and wet to a 2012 event, hot and dry. Barron's very bullish outlook occurs, and we see 450 to six dollar corn in mid July to early August. What okay. are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? How are we going to take advantage because of that? Because right? remember, you probably have some cash sales on the books that you're behind on, you got some hedges on the books you're behind on, and you've got inventory in the bin that you're worried about. And I'm saying you should be selling 2019, but is there anything I can you can't use the word guarantee? But I would say the odds are very high. If December, if December 18 corn would go to 450 plus this summer, you're almost ensuring that more corn acres are going to come to production next year because we've had corn acres going down every year. And guys would like to get back a little more corn acres, I think, given the opportunity. Right. 
So you're almost guaranteeing yourself. I use, I use that word guarantee. I can't use that word. <laughs> the odds are very high if demand has a little weakness. Fall of 2019 prices are going to be on the sewer again. Okay. All right. So, so think you ahead. Need, you need to be. So how are you going to sell for $55 corn? I think you got to either buy a put and roll up, or you got to sell cash. You got to buy a call. So I would argue here in the near, very near future, you need to be buying an alimony call, say a September strike, 450 or lower strike for a dime, so you can do something in that time window if it occurs. Start thinking ahead right now. Think because it, when you get there, if you make the decision. It's July 15th, you won't get anything done. That's what I've learned in all the build market highs I've had in the past. The bear gets blown out, the long loses money, and the farmer decides not to market for the next three years. This is what's <laughs> happened in the previous bull market highs. All right, well, we appreciate your insights as always. We'll be back with more Agile in just a minute. To talk with Bob one on one, call Utterback Marketing Services, toll free at 800 832 1488. Your vote could help a community organization win $10,000 and send a farmer on a dream sports trip. Vote now and help make dreams come true at PowerToDoMore.com. Sponsored by Resicor Corn Herbicide. Welcome back to Ag Day Meteorologist Mike Hoffman here. Mike, looking at a little bit of rain, but actually warmer temperatures. It's not snow. Right, it is definitely warmer. Places. The sad part, this storm system gave some nice beneficial rains to the drought areas, but uh, these areas don't need it in the Midwest. But the showers this morning are from the southern Great Lakes all the way into the mid-Atlantic states, a few lingering across central and south Florida. Next system kind of diving southward. Yeah, that does have a little bit of snow in it. Black Hills back in the parts of uh, the far northern Rockies. This is not a large system, though, as you can see. The eastern one continues to put down uh, a fair amount of rain in places, and it's uh, not exactly moving quickly. So I know a lot of farmers are trying to get out in the field in Indiana and Ohio, and this uh, wasn't exactly the best system to come along. High pressure really up and down the Mississippi River, keeping things uh, mainly dry there. And as we head into the uh, day tomorrow, you can see the uh, s system in the Plain States continues to dive now into Texas, which again, <clears throat> Excuse me, these areas could use some rain, no doubt about it. Uh, that severe drought continues. Panhandle of Texas, Panhandle of Oklahoma, and the system in the east continues to put down a fair amount of rain as we head through this afternoon. It finally does start to move a little more quickly toward the northeast. By late tomorrow, though, high pressure from the northern plains through the entire western states, keeping things pretty much dry. And you can see a precipitation estimate the uh, next 36 hours. Uh, some areas in the mid-Atlantic going to get uh, one to two inches of rain, the way it looks. A little lighter amounts the farther northwest you go. And this system, again, kind of putting down mainly light amounts. Unfortunately, some of those drought areas not looking like a whole lot out of that system. Snowfall amounts, hopefully we can stop using this map before too long. Maybe we will. We're just talking a few of the higher elevations in the Rockies over the next 36 hours. High temperatures today, 50s across the northern tier of states, 70s and 80s by the time you get into the Gulf Coast and the Texas area. And you can see uh, low temperatures tonight. Going to be kind of cold from the uh, northern Rockies into the northern plains with lots of lows in the 30s. But from the Ohio River southward, it's at least 50 degrees for lows. And uh, tomorrow it'll be a little chilly across uh, much of the uh, middle of the country. But with sunshine, not too bad. Uh, 60s and 70s, though, in the southeast and the southern plains. There's the jet stream. Still have some troughs kind of digging in. And you can see this one kind of comes into the Great Lakes in the northeast for this weekend. But then the ridge comes right back and the Arctic air really just doesn't get involved and hopefully that's it for the year. That's a look across the country. That's a, now let's take a look at some local forecasts. First of all, Winnemucca, Nevada, lots of sunshine and warm today, high of 75 degrees. We'll go to the middle of the country, Poplar Bluff, Missouri, mostly cloudy and comfortable, high of 65. And finally, Augusta, Maine, nice today, lots of sunshine, high 67. Coming up, we'll look at the latest milk production report from USDA, and later we'll visit an Arkansas ranch where best management practices are put to good use on the land. And the payoff shows up at a local cafe. On the Dairy Report, milk production in the first quarter, January to March, totaling nearly 54.5 billion pounds. That's up 1.5% compared to last year. March's production was also 1.5% higher. The average number of milk cows on the rise in Q1 up 9,000 head from the end of 2017 and 38,000 higher than a year ago. 
Experts say it's not just the U.S. impacting global dairy supplies. We're looking at New Zealand production that's uh, been below uh, prior years for the last uh, six months. Their production is going to go down. And to, uh, they just cycle down by the summer. We need the Europeans to back off a little bit, and I think we can get that done. Their margins are pretty skinny, um, and I think the U.S. production drops off a little bit. At least the, the growth in production slows. And by fall, early next year, I think dairy prices are better. Milk production per cow here in the U.S. was also higher in March, up 22 pounds from a year ago, and the highest for a March since records began being kept about 15 years ago. In a little under a year from now, Britain will officially leave the European Union. The uncertainty associated with the breakup is creating problems in many ag sectors, especially dairy. A major European dairy cooperative says that currency swings caused by Brexit are among the reason it has to cut costs by nearly a half billion dollars over the next three years. Denmark-based Arla Food says two unexpected developments, the pounds drop after Brexit and a shift in commodity prices are forcing it to act. The co-op cutting administrative jobs and expenses, it employs about 19,000 people. March 29, 2019 will be Britain's last official day with the EU, a 46-year marriage that intertwined economies of 28 European countries. Also out of the EU, the European Union and Mexico reaching their own trade agreement, the deal providing preferential access for many cheeses like Gorgonzola and Roquefort. It also allows the EU to substantially increase its pork exports to Mexico, and nearly all pork products will go in duty-free. And it ensures that Mexico will not allow imitations of 340 distinctive European foods and drink products there in Mexico. Still to come, we'll meet a Ford specialist who talks the talk and walks the walk when it comes to range practices, details as we head into country. In the Country, sponsored by Kubota. Tractors, hay tools, utility vehicles, mowers, and more. Visit KubotaUSA.com today. The University of Arkansas Pasture and Forge Specialist is able to practice what he preaches to Arkansas farmers. That's because Kenny Simon is a third generation cattle producer. Simon is also involved in the local food movement. Ken Moore has details in this report provided by the Arkansas Farm Bureau. In recent years, some Arkansas ranchers have begun selling meat directly to consumers and area restaurants, making use of a growing number of local meat processing that's, facilities. That's One roll. example is Kenny Simon, a U of A Division of Agriculture, Pasture and Forage Specialist and third generation cattle producer near Saltillo in Faulkner County. One of the things that, that we do that I think is pretty unique to this operation is, is my job with the, with the University of Arkansas is is to help promote better forage management, helping to, to get producers where they, they can extend their grazing series, hopefully to where they can get be grazing 300 days a year. And one of the things that, that I pride myself on is always been able to, have had the opportunity to implement a lot of those practices that, that we're out preaching to producers. And so we try to keep, uh, you know, our goal is to be grazing 300 days a year. There's a lot of time that goes into raising the calves this, uh, the, the calves that we're selling are about, will be 16 to 20 months of age and, and weighing around 11 to 1,200 pounds. And, and so there's that, there's that time gap of being able to, to raise them calves, have them calves big enough for slaughter, and the point that, you know, that they're ready to sell. Simon is involved in the local food movement by providing beef to the Root Cafe in downtown Little Rock. The Root Cafe has, has they've been very successful. We got we got a real good working relationship with Jack, and part of that working relationship is is come from from scheduling. You know, we we've, we've been able to provide them beef any time and every time that they've needed it. We uh, find a great beef producer like Simon Farms, and uh, obviously that leads right into having a great burger. Um, uh, we serve meatloaf in the evenings now. Um, so those kinds of things are, are possible because there's a great beef supply coming from Simon Farms. You know, these kids all go to school at Bologna schools, which I still consider a pretty rural school. But there'll be very few kids in the class that actually are, are being raised on a farm. And, and so many of them may not even know what a cow, a cow looks like. So one of the things that, that we really pride on is being able to raise a family uh, out here on the farm. 
and, and are pl privileged to be able to do so. This is Ken Moore reporting. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in from all of us here at Ag Dan Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.